Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. My guest today is Jason Colavito, a, uh, a journalist who has written uh, extensively on a topic that I'm quite interested in myself, the topic of UFOs. And uh, uh, he recently wrote an article called How Washington Got Hooked on Flying Saucers. A collection of well-funded UFO obsessives are using their Capitol Hill connections to launder some outre and potentially dangerous ideas, which was a fascinating read. And uh, what I'd like to do is go over this. So, uh, Jason, welcome to uh, Tales from the Rabbit Hole. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, your, your article is very interesting. And I think it's something that's kind of lacking from the discussion that people have about uh, this kind of current ufo uap story and that's the historical context um how did how did you start researching this aspect of it well this is something i kind of fell into more or less by accident um for the last couple of decades actually i've been interested in the ancient astronaut theory and the related ideas about space aliens coming to earth in ancient times and what have you and because of that, I um, have been on the edges of the whole UFO, UAP discussion, uh, where the ancient astronaut stuff crosses over into UFO speculation. And what happened is that some of the people who were involved with uh, the UFO, UAP thing were also people who were involved with ancient astronaut ideas, specifically Jacques Vallée, who's famous for his book, Passport to Magonia. Uh, in there, he talks about... Um, the connections, uh, the parallels between space alien encounters and uh, mythology and legends from historical and medieval times. And anyway, the long and short of it is that because some of the same people cross over between the two different uh, areas, I sort of fell into investigating the uh, To the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences people who were also some of the same who were involved with the ancient astronaut and other speculation. And uh, the crossover is what led me to look into the history of the UFO flap that we're looking at right now. Yeah, it's, it's all very interesting. And I think uh, something that people miss is that uh, it's a relatively small number of people that are involved. Uh, you know, in your article, you do actually touch on a lot of people, but in the grand scheme of things, there's not that many. And there's these common threads that have been running through uh, these UFO stories for for many, many years. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating just how long some of these people have been around and uh, are still talking about it. Well, that is uh, it is really amazing because you know we the United States has 320 million people in it. And somehow the UFO issue it comes down to the same 20 or 30 people over and over again. And it's amazing to think that the same people who were looking into UFOs in the 1960s and 70s are the same people who are still behind the current UFO flap today. And what makes that especially amazing is that all of them talk about how um, answers are right around the corner if only we do X, Y, and Z. And you know, for 50 something years, they've been doing X, Y, and Z and have produced no results. But this time, they swear, is going to be different. <laughs> yeah, that's always something that uh, amazes me when I look back at uh, the history of UFOs. I, personally, I've, I've just been got into it recently with all the, the, mm -hmm. the video analysis that I've been doing. But then people encourage me to read uh, older accounts. And so I go back to these, these accounts from the 1950s and even the 1940s. And if you read the press coverage back then, it's, it's remarkable how similar it is to what's going on now. It's all, you know, government, what does the government know about flying saucers? You know, inquiring oh, minds want to know. It is. Yeah, it's almost identical. Uh, I was, have been working on a new book that is going to in part cover of some of this early UFO stuff from the 1940s and 50s. So I've also been reading a lot of that and it, it's just the same thing over and over again. <laughs> And even the kinds of encounters that are supposedly, yeah. you know, the shocking new thing is exactly the same. And it's the same kinds of evidence. Well, it's pilot testimony, it's radar evidence, it's this what and that. And it's, you know, the same thing over and over. And each and every time, eventually investigators go through it and find out what really happened and how people misunderstood what they were seeing um, and what they were uh, interpreting the data to say at the time. And somehow each time these flaps happen, and they happen with startling regularity every, usually about every 20 years, 
each and every time this happens, they act like there's no history behind it and that we haven't been through this before. And, you know, it would really be beneficial to everybody to maybe have a historical perspective to look at this and say, well, the last five times this happened, we later discovered it was this problem or this problem, or we didn't understand this or misperceived that. And maybe that should be our starting point instead of the end point so that we kind of circumvent the whole process of, oh, my God, space aliens are invading us before we get to the, oh, well, maybe we should check on this, this and this before we decide the aliens are here. Yeah, you got to learn from history. And this is, you know, something obviously that people talk about. It's like we get a a new generation. It's kind of strange, really, because we're getting new generations, these young guns of ufology. But we're also got the old guard yeah. as well, who are uh, who are being uh, involved in the same thing, yes. and they're kind of like yeah. uh, you know, repeating the same thing with the new people. So let's let's learn from history. Let's uh, let's go back to uh, you know what you describe in your article, and you you start in 1996 uh, with J. Allen Hynek and. Oh, sorry, 1966, yes, yes. <laughs> 1966. <laughs> uh, J. Allen Hynek. Now, J. Allen Hynek was an interesting character because I think at one point he was a skeptic of the whole UFO thing, and then he kind yes. of uh, transitioned. And you yes. talk about him talking to Jacques Vallée. What, what happened there with him and Jacques Vallée? Well, it was uh, during the time of the Condon Committee, the... Um, big Air Force University of Colorado study that was going to determine whether there was any sort of uh, national security threat behind UFO sightings. And both Heineck and Valet were asked to speak with the committee. So they had flown out to Colorado to talk with them and give their evidence um, for the UFOs. And on the way back, um, Valet and Heineck got to talking and Heineck admitted that while he played the Uh, materialist and scientist for the public, behind the scenes, he wasn't exactly uh, strictly, according to the scientific method, he had a very strong interest in the occult. And from his earliest days, he had been really interested in this sort of immaterial psychical world beyond the uh, material plane. In fact, he told a story later to Valet that When he was a kid, all the other uh, teenagers were saving up money to buy motorcycles. And he saved up $100, which in those days was a huge amount of money, so that he could buy a book of occultism and Mm. learn about... For $100? For $100, yes. It was uh, Manly Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. It was a huge self-published book of the occult, and uh, it was wickedly expensive back then. I mean, a hundred bucks back in the 1930s was like thousand something dollars today. Yeah. yeah, That's crazy. And he saved up that money to buy that book. And it was a huge influence on him because he was um, very deeply uh, involved with this idea that somewhere beyond the material plane, there was this immaterial psychical realm that might be impugning on our reality. And while in practical terms, that didn't necessarily mean that he was skewing his science to go all occult, it did mean, however, that when he started to think about what UFOs could be or might be, he did have this concept in the back of his mind that they might not be material, Mm -hmm. that they might not be nuts and bolts, um, alien spacecraft, for example. And one of the things that he and Valet spent uh, many years in the late 60s and the mid 70s debating is whether they could be psychical phenomena. In other words, um, they, they were interested in whether they were closely related to poltergeists. Uh, that was hmm. the one that both Valet and Heineck were uh, very interested in because they thought that poltergeist phenomena had a lot of similarities to UFOs. The people who see poltergeists and the people who see UFOs both tended to have the same reactions to them and to demonstrate the same kind of mental phenomena, uh, so to speak. Um, Interesting. Yeah, well, the idea back then was that uh, the people who were seeing poltergeists tended to be more sensitive, more open to things, uh, what we would today probably term a uh, fantasy prone personalities. And um, what they saw in the connection was that poltergeists had um, 
physical manifestation in one sense, because people believe that poltergeists being ghosts that were able to move objects could, you know, throw a book across a room, could cause electrical phenomena and so on. And they were also supernatural because they existed beyond the material realm. They weren't physical objects that had mass and matter, and yet they were having a physical impact on the environment around them. So mm. in the mind of poltergeist researchers, the poltergeists were both supernatural and had a material impact on this plane. And so what Heineck and Vele were interested in is the question of whether the poltergeist phenomenon could be said to be parallel to or even part of the UFO phenomenon, so that UFOs were somehow or another these immaterial objects that were coming from either another plane or another dimension, popping into ours, having a physical interaction with ours, while not themselves being physical, and then sort of dissolving back where they came from. So mm. that was where they started to go. And, you know, Heineck even gave a speech about it to a psychical research organization. So it's not like this was hidden, but he didn't really publicize it because he knew that if the media got wind that he was talking about psychic UFO, UFOs popping in from another dimension, that, you know, he'd be labeled crazy along with everybody else who was uh, talking about alien abductions and anal probes and what have you. And he wanted to keep his UFO research, you know, the serious, sober UFO research, right. as opposed to, you know, the psychic aliens and the more or less yeah. crazy stuff. So and at that time, both uh, Valet and, and Heineck were kind of doing work for like government investigations and things like that, like Project Blue Book with Heineck and then later Valet was, was doing, uh, was working for the government in some capacity. Is that true? Um, to my uh, recollection, I don't recall Jacques Vallée working directly okay. with the federal government, but Heineck right. was, uh, had worked with Project Blue Book um, until the end of Project Blue Book. But uh, both Heineck and Vallée were in close connection with the uh, researchers of the uh, Stanford Research Institute who were doing work um, on contract for the government with uh, psychic phenomena. Okay. Uh, one of the people that they uh, worked with was Hal Putoff, and he was um, very much into the whole question of psychics and psychic powers. He had researched Yuri Geller, uh, the famous uh, psychic spoonbender, yeah. and he was a strong advocate of Yuri Geller and truly believed that Yuri Geller had psychic powers and could bend spoons with his mind. And because they um, were all friends with one another, it sort of filtered in through Heineck and Valet to put off and to the people that he came to be uh, to work with this idea that there was a connection between UFOs and psychic phenomena. And now one of the interesting things is that the government was actually interested in this psychic research for a variety of historical reasons, none of which were very good. The long and short of it being that they thought the Soviets were using psychic spies to monitor America's uh, nuclear arsenal and our defense industry right. by uh, training psychics in Russia to use their mental projection to see what was going on inside our facilities. And this so is a real thing, said, isn't it? This yeah, is this yeah. is something that's documented, and we we know that it, oh, it yeah, actually certainly. happened. Yeah, that they uh, they it believed Project, that. Yeah, it was called Project Stargate. And a whole lot of files related to it uh, from the CIA and Defense Department were declassified a couple of decades ago. And they're all available online. You can go and look at them anytime you like. But uh, and they really the did film, believe in this sort of thing. The film Men Who Stare at Goats, uh, that's yeah. kind of based on that. I mean, yeah, it's not same. entirely a work of fiction. It's actually kind of based on a true story. Oh, yeah, that was all part of it. You know, at the yeah. time, the government was into all sorts of very strange things. You know, the... Uh, the U.S. Congress, for example, contacted the CIA repeatedly over the course of the 1970s and 80s and asked them to use spy satellites to find Noah's Ark. Really? The government has really, elements within the government have believed. People. Of, yes, people. <laughs> Sometimes small groups, usually it's individuals, but have used the power of the government to investigate all sorts of uh, things that we would objectively consider highly unlikely. Yeah. So, you know, UFOs was just, were just one of many different things. But in the case of the psychic phenomena, um, 
not only did the government pursue this idea that uh, psychic spies could be used to look into Russian assets, they some of those psychic sessions, you know, turned into ancient astronaut hunts. In one um, one file that was released, uh, a CIA mm-hmm. uh, handler had a uh, remote viewer, and they went back in time one million years to probe Martian civilization and commune with ancient Martians. Huh. You know, and this, this is was, the federal government doing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was funded by the federal government and oh, yeah, you know, someone yeah. obviously pushed for this, this research to happen because people believed that mm-hmm. these things were real, some people within, within the government. Yes, there, uh, you know, you have to remember that at, in the middle 20th century, the CIA was into all sorts of bizarre things. So while this seems strange, it's part of a continuum with the same CIA that was strapping bombs to cats and creating exploding cigars and all of the other bizarre things that, in retrospect, pretty obviously were never going to work. Yeah. But, you know, at the time, they uh, had a much broader idea of what was plausible than I think many of us would today. Yeah, it's fascinating, uh, and obviously a lot of this still resonates uh, to today. And we we see mm-hmm. this this type of thing being repeated to a certain degree. Uh, and the people you mentioned, you know, they're, they're still around. Obviously, Jacques Vallée, uh, mm-hmm. he was. I just saw him interviewed about this whole thing recently. And and Hal Putoff has yes. been part of of, of the whole uh, recent stuff. I think he was doing some work with with Tom DeLong. So, yes. even though we're off, talking about, yeah, he's. Uh, he was a uh, has been a major figure in that for uh, many many decades. Not only was he part of that remote viewing psychic stuff, but he moved on to work with Robert Bigelow, the uh, right. very wealthy eccentric hotelier who started an aerospace company to pursue his interest in the paranormal. He um, was deeply interested in space aliens, in life after death, and the occult, and all of that sort of thing. And put off work with him to investigate uh, space aliens, uh, werewolves, skinwalkers, um, space spooks, demons when from was, other dimensions. When was that approximately? The, uh, uh, that was in the early night, early to mid nineteen nineties. Early nineties, yeah. So it's still a long time ago. It's you know this is this is still history. You know, we're talking about stuff that started in the nineteen sixties and then seventies, eighties, nineties. That program that that. Um, that relationship formed the core of what became the Pentagon's UFO program. Right. And that's because Robert Bigelow was the guy who called up Harry Reid and said more or less that he wanted funding to go study um, the space ghosts and the space spooks at his Skinwalker ranch in Utah. And Harry Reid said, yes, you know, uh, Bigelow had, and his ranch had spent years with a team of scientists led by Hal Putoff and some other people who are still the same ones looking at stuff today, uh, stuff today. But they had spent years hunting down what they thought were interdimensional portals where space aliens or space poltergeists or what have you were leaking through from the sky to another dimension. And somehow or another, they actually convinced a scientist from the Defense Intelligence Agency that this really happened and that they had found a portal to another dimension or whatever. And the DIA began to investigate and they actually decided they were going to work with Bigelow at Skinwalker Ranch to hunt space spooks. And because of that, Bigelow was able to take that relationship and go to Harry Reid and say, Hey, this is what we're doing now. Give us money so we can do this formally as part of a broader program investigating unexplained aerial phenomena. And Harry Reid and two other senators agreed to do that. And what's interesting about that is that they're retroactively casting this as a UFO program, but it wasn't a UFO program when it started. It was a program to hunt poltergeists from another dimension. And it sounds ridiculous, and it is ridiculous, but it's what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, it's, and they're it's quite amazing. Whitewashing it now and saying, oh, well, it was always about these unexplained aerial phenomena that could be a national security threat. Except when they started, they were hunting down interdimensional beings and were- werewolves and skinwalkers and what have you. And we can see that in the report that Robert Bigelow's team filed um, during this initial program that Harry Reid had funded. And in that report, they talk about other dimensions. They talk about alien implants. 
They talk about whether space alien encounters cause uh, health effects that impact uh, human health. And they go into all of this weird and bizarre stuff. In fact, in the New Yorker article about it, one of the defense uh, officials actually says in there, well, we knew when we read it, we can't release this. It would be a disaster. And right. that's because it's just so very strange. And what happens is that the program gets sort of filed and filtered down into, well, we were looking at unexplained aerial phenomena. And they leave out all of the weird stuff in order to make it sound more serious and sober. In fact, Ralph Blumenthal, the New York Times reporter, who uh, broke the story of the Pentagon UFO program in 2017, he actually admitted recently that you know they purposely kind of shaped the narrative to focus on the UFO program and not all of the other weird stuff because they didn't think that New York Times readers would accept the broader weirder part. And you know that's one of those things where you have to say, if you're shaping the narrative because you don't think your readers will believe it, maybe you ought to step back and say, what the heck's going on here? We ought to be telling them they're doing this weird stuff. And we really ought to think about, hey, maybe hunting space ghosts on the taxpayer's dime needs a little bit of a rethink. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, this, this kind of shaping the narrative is something that's happened quite a lot. And you know, one small aspect of that is um, Bigelow's involvement with the FAA. Uh, which is something I just looked into a little bit recently. If, if you look into the guidelines, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, has for reporting UFOs, now they just have uh, like a single paragraph that says, uh, you know, if you think it's a danger, call the local authorities, otherwise report it to a, a UFO collection uh, site. And they give an example of, of, of New Fork, I think, the, the National UFO Reporting uh, Council. But if you go kind of back in time on those regulations, uh, you get... Robert Bigelow's phone number, the, the Bigelow <laughs> Aerospace uh, Science Research Center. And if you go back even further in time on the FAA regulations, you get, uh, you get the phone number and the website of NIDS, the National yep. Institute for Discovery Science, I believe, yep, I uh, Bigelow's which group. is Robert Bigelow back in, yep. back in the 90s, uh, maybe the early 2000s. Yep. And this was his institute for studying the paranormal and studying UFOs and studying things like cattle mutilations. Yeah. And if you go to the NIS website, which is archived, uh, you can see that, you know, it looks like a typical you know, website from the nineties and it's got this little rotating pyramid on it. And uh, it has a reporting form for UFOs and which, you know, apparently at the time was the official FAA, the federal uh, uh, site to report UFOs. But on that same form, it has two links. Uh, one link is for reporting cattle mutilations. And the other link is for reporting entities. And you click on the entities reporting uh, link, and it's this form about essentially reporting ghosts. And, you know, it's things like, you know, did the temperature change when you saw this entity and you know, what was going on in the air? And did you hear any strange noises? And so you've got this this federal body, the, the FAA, with this direct link to this kind of weird pseudoscience, uh, this this ghost investigation, and it's 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 kind of bizarre, like how they did that actually happen? How did the FAA get persuaded to do this? Now I, I spoke to one air traffic controller a few years ago, and he told me they were actually happy to get this phone number. Uh, for Bigelow, because people used to call them all the time reporting UFOs, and they they didn't know what to do with them. You know, they saw some light in the sky, but now they had a phone number to give, so they could just pass them off. But uh, you know, it isn't really going anywhere. But yes, it's uh, it's it's fascinating that the federal government has been essentially infiltrated to a small degree with these people. Well, it's not just. Robert Bigelow, who, who did that, of course, you know, Bigelow is the driving force behind this because of his very uh, powerful interest, not specifically in space aliens. In fact, he recently said he's not interested in UFOs anymore, but in this occult worldview overall. And, you know, that Bigelow is deeply involved with all of the people who are connected to every phase of the alien UFO world. You know, when you look at the uh, 1990s alien abduction conferences and things, you know, the people have pictures there of themselves with Robert Bigelow because he was into the alien abduction stuff and all, and all of that. But 
his influence goes far beyond just the formal infiltration of governments and the perversion of America's uh, UFO investigations toward his occult ends. You know, what you see is that people begin to be drawn into the world that he and his team have created. And for example, uh, as I had said before, Hal Putoff was interested in all this psychic stuff. And it's interesting to see that in the government documents, you read that when Project Stargate, the remote viewing psychical research stuff, came to an end, uh, and they're folding it up, one of the documents talks about the people at the Pentagon who were read into the program and who were apparently already familiar with it. With it. And one of them is Chris Mellon. Mm-hmm. And he was intrigued by, to say the least, this Stargate research. And uh, according to the, uh, the documents, he was already deeply familiar with and well-versed in the program, uh, the psychical research and all that stuff. And Christopher Mellon becomes one of the leading uh, pushers of the current UFO narrative. And I don't think that's entirely a coincidence because you see that once he leaves government, he goes into lobbying, but he revolves around this UFO world and around the people who are part of the Bigelow put off psychic stuff so that when To The Stars Academy launches, Christopher Mellon is drawn into that. And he's there with people who are part of the Bigelow team, people like Hal Putoff. And they're all part of the same group just under a new name. So you see the same group of people moving. They pick up and drop members occasionally over time because, you know, after 50 years, not everyone's still around. But the same core group keeps moving through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s. It's the same people with the same narrative over and over again. And whether the color they put on it is remote viewing or UFO investigations or space poltergeists, the color is just the top level because inside of that is always this same idea that what we're really looking at isn't space aliens, it isn't a specific phenomenon, but rather it's this sort of nebulous, almost anti-scientific idea that there is this spiritual, material, immaterial ultra dimensional reality beyond the physical world. It's kind of that rejection of modernity, almost this rejection of materialism of what we would consider science, but they would probably say is a false science because it's only focused on the material, but this almost Gnostic rejection of reality in favor of some sort of cosmic truth that lay beyond the physical world. It's fascinating. Uh, And, and, yeah, they describe this themselves, or Valet, Valet describes it as the invisible college. Uh, that that, that yeah. term like yeah. dates back quite a long time, I believe, and, well, and it's it still in use now. Yeah, it was a joking term that Valet had used in one of his books to describe the uh, researchers that were positioned throughout academia and the government that he felt were sympathetic to his cause, um, most of whom eventually became part of his orbit. You know that Jacques Vallée, he doesn't stand apart from all of this. He's been intimately involved with it the whole time, too. Uh, he was one of the uh, members of the Board of Advisors to NIDS. He uh, became uh, closely connected to, to the stars. He wasn't formally part of it, but he worked with them in testing so-called metamaterials, looking for crashed alien wreckage. And even now, he just published a new book in which he claims to have found evidence that the United States government retrieved a crashed uh, space mm-hmm. alien flying saucer in 1945, I believe it was, uh, before Roswell. And, you know, that book carries right on. It's a big endorsement from Chris Mellon saying that he thought that this was the most compelling proof yet that the government is harboring secret alien technology, says the guy who was most recently quoted in saying that, you know, it's we don't know that it's aliens. Except when you make money off of it, your friends make money off of it, and you put it on the cover of a book, right? So how does this, how does a physical craft fit into Valet's worldview? If if he thought it was interdimensional manifestations, uh, then now we have a a crashed physical craft. Yeah, that's one of those things where there's this kind of ambiguity, um, mostly because a lot of the people who advocate these things haven't really 
thought them through for rigorous mm. consistency. Because when it comes down to UFO speculation, mostly you keep throwing ideas at the wall until something sticks. They throw out dozens of different ideas until finally something seems partly right and then say, I told you so. But in Valet's case, uh, he does believe that they're both psychical and somehow material at the same time. In his book, he actually speculates that these immaterial ultra-dimensional beings are creating these, using their psychic powers to create basically flying saucers that they then purposely drive into our dimension and crash into the earth so that we can retrieve the technology and benefit from their glorious insights. Really? Hmm. Yeah, That's really. It's in his book. It's called the best kept secret. And he just published self published it. Uh, it was last month, I think. And yeah. it was, uh, it was not good. <laughs> it was not a good book, but I have, uh, I have not looked yeah, at it yet. But. He, uh, and like all of the, uh, UFO and ancient astronaut theorists, he doesn't actually say, this is what happened. He asks questions and he says, could it be? And I think it might be the case that. So even if he does turn out to be wrong, he said, well, I never actually said that. I was only speculating that it might be until we found something different. So, and that's how they get away with a lot of things. You know, it's the same in almost all those pseudo fields where you're just asking questions like Eric Von Donegan, the famous ancient astronaut theorist in Chariots of the Gods. That was his whole line. He would get confronted time and again with, well, we did the research and we found this claim wasn't true. We found that, no, there isn't a cave filled with, filled with alien gold in Ecuador. And no, uh, the space aliens didn't really build the pyramids before Noah's flood. And every single time he said, well, I didn't actually say that. I'm just asking questions. But the thing yeah, is I, that, I that readers lot. and viewers they don't hear you asking a question. They hear you saying, this is what I think. And they don't pay attention to the niceties of it. And, you know, their assumption is if you're asking the question, it's because you think the answer is yes. Yes, indeed. You don't ask questions that you don't think have positive answers. Yeah. I I was listening to a a podcast with uh, Lou Elizondo recently, and he was asked about (laughs) the Invisible College. And he also mentioned something called uh, the aviary which uh, uh, I'd not heard of before, uh, which apparently is this secret organization where people use bird names as code names. Are you familiar with this? Like the College of Owls from Batman? I don't don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's it's kind of like the Invisible College, but it's a way of people to talk about each other without revealing who they are talking about. This is something Lou Elizondo talked about. I'm not not making this up. It's... uh, it's, don't Some kind of secret. <laughs> secret. I don't think society. there's anything from UFO lore that he hasn't at some point or another just asked questions about. You yeah. Know. He I recently, think... uh, he was recently talking about how he thinks that there's going to be this grand rebirth of civilization when disclosure shows mm. us that the aliens are changing our ideas of philosophy and religion and what have you. And he, in another recent interview, he more or less conceded that he thinks that all of this is down to ultra terrestrials, you know, the interdimensional space spooks. And, you know, at some point you have to realize that while he banks a lot on his credibility as a former Pentagon official, a lot of the words that come out of his mouth aren't his words. They're Jacques Vallée's words, they're Hal Putoff's words, they're ideas from 1970s and 1980s uh, ancient astronaut books and UFO books, and even by his own admission from 1970s science fiction. He uh, cited a sci-fi story from 1973 or four or whatever it was as um, one of the frameworks through which he tries Hmm. to understand UFOs. This idea that there's a hidden civilization underneath the ocean and they're sending UFOs to the surface is uh, probes from this uh, sort of invisible hidden secret world <laughs> like okay yeah. um got some evidence yeah, we, for that the way you, you talk about this and the way you describe it the influence that uh that valet and putoff uh, and others mm-hmm. have throughout the years it almost it almost seems like a like a very small cult with a, a kind of limited number of people in in positions of 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 
of influence who, who throughout the years have been kind of trying to, to get this narrative across and they've been recruiting people throughout the years. Like Elizondo, I don't know if would he have been a UFO believer before he got involved in this ATIP program? Do you think perhaps he just simply... According to him, he was not. No. So he became convinced, uh, kind of like yes. the, the mind virus of, uh, of, of Jack <laughs> well, Valet, yeah, basically. Uh, and, and Putoff. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound, yeah, I don't want to sound conspiratorial here because it's not like no. there was a vast conspiracy of pod people who are kind of sucking brains dry. But yeah, what there but... is, is a network of influence. Right. You know, there are people who are interested in UFOs as a topic. You know, I can't say that I've never been interested in UFOs. I wouldn't be here sure. if I hadn't been at some point. But uh, what happens is people get interested in topics and then they become radicalized by exposure to a particular set of ideas that they feel is uh, powerful and prestigious. And within the UFO field, for better or for worse, Jacques Vallée's ideas uh, are prestigious. A long, long time ago, before I really knew anything about Jacques Vallée, I had uh, read one of his books. It was called Wonders in the Sky. And in it, uh, he went through a uh, thousand years of UFO sightings and took all these ancient and medieval texts and analyzed them and presented them and said, this is the evidence for UFOs over, over time. And I thought, wow, this is crap. And that's because as somebody who is interested in ancient and medieval literature, I'd read a lot of the source texts and being able to read the original languages. I had read through a lot of that material and, and recognized that, you know, these things aren't translated, right? This doesn't say what you think it says. And in some cases, like the author literally says at the end, but it was all a dream or this never <laughs> happened. <laughs> You're leaving this part out. So I had started writing about that on my blog and and uh, talked about all of the, the mistakes that I found in his book. And one of the things that I kept getting was uh, emails from very angry, very outraged people who were saying, you know, Jacques Vallée is the most respected ufologist in the world, and you can't criticize him. He's one of the greats, and so on. And like, well, it's wrong. <laughs> I'm not going right. to tell you it's right just because he's a, an old man who is an uh, inspiration for Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's just wrong. Yeah, and yeah, I, when I went back and looked, those errors aren't just in that one book. He was repeating them for half of a century, the same errors over and over and over. And because of his reputation, he's a Frenchman and a philosopher, and he was a great thinker on UFOs. No one ever checked. Like right. for 50 years, all the way from Passport to Magonia on, no one ever thought, maybe we should look this up in the actual book he's quoting and see, does it say what he says it says? Oh, it doesn't? It's that kind of deference to authority yeah. that kind of permeates this UFO culture where people are Definitely. saying, well, the authority figure says so, and therefore it must be right. And it builds this sort of self-referential mental world where people are in this philosophical system where they believe things because other people believe them. And the other people believe them because people said that believed in them years before. And all of that sort of becomes reinforcing and it goes around in a circle over and over and that's why you get the same people cycling through and you get the same ideas cycling through the same three ideas that started in when kenneth arnold saw his first flying saucers in 1947 are still there today three days after kenneth arnold saw the flying saucers there were already uh, three major hypotheses for what ufos were that they were uh, either american or soviet technology that they were spacecraft from another world, or that they were supernatural entities, um, basically demons, and that they were heralding the end times. Right. And those are still the same three hypotheses that we're working with today. And that's ridiculous. It's it been nearly 75 years, and we're still dealing with the same three things that people speculated about randomly three days after the UFO was first seen. And we're still getting it um, having an effect on on the government. Essentially, I mean, the federal government is doing yes. things based on on these people and this these these recycled ideas and the influence they've had on other people. Um, well, the thing about that, though, is that the federal government gets into this not because 
they see it a national security crisis. But right at the beginning, it's because of popular and public interest. Mm -hmm. And that filters into the government and starts to create this snowball effect where they begin investigating because the public is interested and especially because the media are interested. And that in turn generates more media coverage, which generates more investigation. And what happens is that people within the Pentagon, especially all the way back to the late 1940s, there's this small group within the Pentagon who think, oh yeah, well, this could be actually be aliens. And that group becomes self-perpetuating and self-reinforcing, no matter how hard Pentagon leadership tries to stamp it out. And they did for decades, try to stamp it out yeah. because, um, they recognize that these people were acting more or less irrationally in believing this. When you go back to the early reports in the 1940s, you find that in 1947, the FBI investigated and more or less determined that they thought that the whole idea that flying saucers were alien spacecraft, they believed it almost certainly came from the work of Ray Palmer, who was a uh, science fiction editor for one of the pulp science fiction magazines who had begun promoting this, this idea that flying saucers were space alien craft at a time when most people didn't think that they were. And they thought, they concluded in one of their reports that it was more or less Ray Palmer's advocacy that created the media frenzy that these were space alien craft, which in turn influenced the public to believe it. But within a couple of years, you find people in the Pentagon who are arguing that they must be space alien craft. Now, why hmm. did they do that? It wasn't because they had evidence that these things came from another world. When you read the reports, what you find is that the people who advocated for space alien craft eliminated every other possibility that in space aliens because they didn't believe that pilots were capable of being wrong. That was because at the time, now you have to remember this is the late 1940s when all pilots were men and everyone was incredibly sexist. But they believed that if you saw UFOs, you were being hysterical. Right. Pilots couldn't be hysterical because they were super masculine he-men and couldn't have a woman's disease and be effeminate and thinking and seeing things in the sky. So if the pilots couldn't be wrong, because that would compromise national security, because it would mean that our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen weren't masculine he-men, but were in fact capable of being hysterical and irrational. If they couldn't be wrong, then flying saucers had to be from another world because they couldn't be anything else. Yeah. And it is yeah. that, that, yeah, it's that idea that we have to trust pilots to draw conclusions about what they see because for them to be wrong is to question the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, America's entire national security infrastructure that yields this kind of snowball effect of this uh, snowballing effect of the, um, the mythology of flying saucers as alien spacecraft. And that's still what we see today. Not yeah. necessarily the masculinity uh, hysteria thing, but still that idea that if you question pilots' conclusions about what they see, not necessarily what they saw, people see what they see, but how they interpret what they see, you're somehow questioning national security, you're questioning authority, and that's an impossibility if you want to maintain your good patriotic standing. Yeah, it's very true. It's uh, something I, I hear all the time is that, you know, how can you not believe that this pilot has said this thing? Mm -hmm. uh, and also that people say that if this is true, then we have this this terrible problem that, uh, you know, we've got this issue where pilots are seeing things. They see it as some kind of disaster uh, mm -hmm. for, for national security that, that a pilot can't identify something when really it's a fairly straightforward and mundane thing that, that pilots are sometimes not going to be able to identify things or they will sometimes misidentify things but you know, i want to move on worth considering oh no i was just going to say real quick that something worth sure. considering um i don't know if you've ever read a book called the mind in the cave by david lewis williams no. it's a book about uh, paleolithic culture but mm. it goes into this idea that the mind has within it i don't want to call them archetypes because carl jung kind of drove that mm. into the occult ground but these uh, sort of generic forms, right? Uh, things like circles and squiggles and spirals and what have you. And that these things can be auto-generated within the mind um, in response to ambiguous stimuli. Mm -hmm. So what happens is any human mind anywhere in the world will automatically generate or react to these shapes. But how we interpret those shapes is determined by a cultural script. 
So for example, uh, if we see a uh, lightning bolt shape, we'll interpret that as a lightning bolt. But another culture might see that as a snake in the sky. Right. Similarly, uh, what we find throughout time is that people see circles um, in the sky, obviously common shape, but it's something that Lewis Williams talks about um, as one of the core archetypical shapes that are generated um, in altered states of consciousness um, in situations where there's a lot of stress or anxiety and what have you, that it can be self-generated from within the mind. But what you see when you see that circle, whether you see a chariot pulled by the uh, horses of the sun, whether you see an alien spacecraft with windows um, or what have you, is determined by the cultural script. And one of the things that we find in our culture is that because Ray Palmer had created this mythology that things seen in the sky were alien spacecraft, which he was doing to sell magazines because he was selling magazines about stories of alien invasion. Because we have that cultural script that's been reinforced for 70 some odd years now, the cultural script that we interpret, we use in, uh, to interpret ambiguous stimuli ends up shaping what we see into these cultural messages, even if they're not, you know, actually there. It's not that anything is going wrong in your mind. It's not that you're hallucinating or seeing things, but when you get an ambiguous stimuli, a stimulus of any kind, a light, um, a shape, what have you, it runs through these archetypical forms and is processed through a cultural script so that you interpret it according to what you believe you're going to interpret. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's the explanation for every UFO, obviously, but it does explain how there can actually be something you're seeing, but what you're interpreting and experiencing isn't necessarily what's directly in front of you. Yeah. I think you do see that in, in many UFO cases as well that were, were solved. Uh, and especially with pilots, because pilots often get ambiguous stimuli because uh, the things they see in the air are often small or far away or just simply lights. And one of the common ones that has, has happened a few times in the past is that pilots will mistake Venus for an oncoming plane. And that's not so much a, you know, a, a cultural archetype. It's um, what pilots are used to seeing in the sky. Their mm -hmm. brains have been hard, well, hardwired, but like uh, uh, programmed over time by lots of experience into interpreting things around them as flying craft. Because a, a large yeah. part of being a pilot is avoiding other planes. Uh, <laughs> you know, yes. Not that you're bumping into them all the time, but you have to be aware <laughs> of where other planes are and you have right. to identify traffic in various locations. So your brain is constantly seeking out other planes. So when you see something that's a bit ambiguous, like a, a Venus devoid of any, any context, a little light in the sky, you tend to interpret it as you know, the type of thing that you are looking for, a, a flying craft. And then when it doesn't move exactly as you, as you expect, because it, it is in fact a distant, far away object, you interpret that that motion or that parallax or whatever, it's relative motion uh, as being some kind of amazing acceleration or something like that. It's, uh, uh, it's you, you kind of, your mental framework imposes yeah. order on ambiguous stimuli and makes it non-ambiguous, but not necessarily the correct non-ambiguous interpretation. Uh, so here we are with the UAP report about to drop in a few days. <laughs> uh, the Pentagon has, has uh, had these programs of, of alien, well, UFO investigations and historically paranormal investigations. Do you think things are going to change in the future? Do you think the Pentagon is going to want to extricate itself from this situation? <laughs> I wish I had a good answer for that. I'd like to think that they would, but... Uh... Historically speaking, there have always been at least some people within the Pentagon who have been interested in occult, paranormal, and strange ideas. Obviously, the Pentagon is not a monolith, and I don't think we can expect that there'll be one totalitarian decision from the top down that we'll never speak of this again. Uh, my guess would be that, like with previous flaps, the Pentagon leadership will mostly wash their hands of it and it'll go back to being some strange thing that happens in the background from lower level people who maintain an interest in it. I don't really know though. A lot of it's going to depend on what Congress does. 
right. because if the people in Congress who have become increasingly radicalized by media coverage, and that is something to note, the radicalization you see in members of Congress on this issue isn't really due to any new developments in UFOs. It's due to the New York Times and the New Yorker putting these stories right where the Congress people are going to see them. And it's especially due to Chris Mellon and his friends lobbying them and saying, you know, we should do something about this while pointing to the, the news stories that they themselves had helped get into the newspapers and the magazines to justify it, saying, see, it's in the media, we need to do something. Well, yeah, but you put it in the media, so <laughs> you're saying yeah. you need to do something because you put it there. But a lot of it's going to come down to what Congress decides to do. If, for example, uh, the Congress people actually read the stuff that I wrote and say, hey, wait, maybe this is a little uh, problematic and we should back off on this, then, you know, it might fizzle out and nothing will happen. If, on the other hand, Marco Rubio or uh, John Warren, uh, John Moore, I got the wrong senator's name, but <laughs> if Mark Senate, Warner, Mark Warner. Uh, yes, the current senator, uh, John Warner was a former senator. Uh, anyway, if Marco Rubio and John Warner, again, Mark Warner say that they're going to uh, hold hearings and want to probe the issue further, or if they do like Harry Reid did and start appropriating money for further research, then, you know, this might drag on for months or years or what have you, it really, a lot is going to depend on how the media react to it and how Congress decides or doesn't decide to go forward after seeing the public and media reaction to the report. Yeah. It's, uh, I guess the invisible college isn't going anywhere. So they're going to be trying to, uh, you know, push their narrative going forward. But well, I on think- the plus side, uh, <laughs> you know, they can't stick around, forever. So unless the new generation um, continues to advocate with the same tenacity as the previous Mm -hmm. one, eventually the um, people who are ensconced in government with an interest in this subject won't be there anymore. You know, we can't can't expect the same people from the 1970s to still be there in the 2020s and beyond. So um, So a lot will depend on the new generation. Yeah, a lot depends on how how well the new generation takes up the banner, I guess. You know, Lou Elizondo wants to be one of the leaders of it. And it's clear that he doesn't have the, um, the ability to worm into the bureaucracy the way previous generations did. You know, they kept a lot of their strange ideas secret. They didn't talk about the weirdest stuff in public. And mm-hmm. they certainly didn't make a spectacle of themselves most of the time while they were trying to lobby for the CIA or the DIA or what have you to spend money investigating the occult and the paranormal. They wanted to get it done and they used their power to do it, but they didn't crow about it where people would see it and think, hey, wait a second, maybe that's kind of weird that we're spending all this money to hunt psychic space ghosts. Yeah. I wonder if maybe things are going to backfire because there's been so much publicity and so much interest in the story and now the report the report will come out and it'll just be a, a list of unsolved ufo cases mm. and people are going to be asking you know what's the big deal how did we get here and you know i hope people do actually you know read your article yeah. and look at the history of what's going on and see just just how much uh, strangeness and what strange beliefs underlie a lot of what's actually going on well, and if there's perhaps- any consolation it's that uh, each iteration has been a little less competent and a little less powerful than the one before. You know, when Robert Bigelow and Nids was doing all of that, you know, they were right there with a, not a massive program, but they had a funded program. They were producing reports. They had allies throughout the government and what have you. And now we're down to, to the stars, which ended up breaking apart because they couldn't keep their story straight long enough to get anything substantive done. We had Tom DeLong talking about Lemuria and psychic space ghosts and what have mm-hmm. you on, on the one hand, and Mellon and Elizondo lobbying for a UFO report on the other. And now we're down to Skyfort, the newest iteration, which um, Elizondo is um, ambiguously part of. He's on their advisory board. Yeah, uh, and strange. Skyfort, you know, so far they seem to be completely amateurish about it. 
they couldn't even manage to get their role out right. They uh, stumbled into having Tucker Carlson accidentally reveal their existence. And then um, a reporter managed to <laughs> find all of their secret uh, information on their website that they didn't uh, secure very well. So, you know, a lot of yeah. what has happened each time, it's a little bit less organized, a little bit more amateurish with each round as this issue kind of becomes more and more diffuse. And part of that's a good thing because, you know, they're stumbling into success mostly because the media is helping them to do it. So if the media stops covering this like it's a national security crisis. The whole rationale for their existence goes away. But on the other hand, the fact that this is becoming more diffuse and less centered means that it's the belief in it is spreading through society. You know, in the right. surveys uh, that were taken about belief in these ideas, uh, Chapman University for uh, several years conducted a survey about um, American fears and beliefs in the paranormal and the occult and all of that sort of thing. And what you saw in each of those surveys is that the number of people who were reporting belief in flying saucers, in ancient astronauts, and uh, contact with ghosts and the paranormal and all of that increased steadily through the 2010s. And, you know, Chapman University stopped conducting that survey, so we don't have um, recent data from the last year or two. But the trend lines were pretty clear, and they very clearly follow media interest in a subject. Yeah. When cable TV was doing a bunch of documentaries about ancient astronauts and ancient aliens, you saw belief in that rise. Now, at any one given time, there aren't that many people watching a cable TV show about it. There weren't that many people watching a cable TV show from the Luis Elizondo either. But what you see is that the legitimization process, that these things are being talked about in the media, helps create this impression that there's something serious and substantive behind it, even when it's just a bunch of tall tales and ambiguous data that are getting thrown out with a bunch of 1940s sci-fi theories. But because the New York Times says this is important, because the New Yorker says this is important, because you can see documentaries about it on the History Channel, it gets that air of importance that becomes self-referential and self-perpetuating. People come to believe that even if they just lightly think, well, maybe there's something to it, they come to that conclusion because of the agenda setting function of the media. The media say this is happening and this is important. Therefore, people at least provisionally accept, okay, this is at least as credible as whatever is happening on the news. And so while it's great that the uh, UFO advocates are not nearly as um, politically powerful as they had been in the past in the sense of being able to direct the functions um, of government and bend uh, the Pentagon to their will. It's not so good that the reason for that is because the ideas that they're advocating aren't limited to just one small segment of the population now, but are widely believed by anywhere mm -hmm. from a third to half of Americans. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's not a good thing. Yeah, it's kind of broken out from the, uh, this, you know, obviously it's always been a thing, the UFO belief, but uh, the, the legit legitimization of it is what is, is kind of spreading now. People are saying there is definitely something to it because I saw it in the New York Times. My, my hope here is that there will kind of be a second wave of journalism uh, <laughs> in, in this after oh, wow. the report is released and we kind of get a clearer picture of what's actually uh, been going on and that people will... Mm -hmm. Uh, some more serious journalists, inc including hopefully the New York Times, will actually look into uh, the story with a bit more of a critical eye and a bit well, uh, better perspective. You know, the New York Times used as their UFO reporter from 2017 to 2020, Leslie Keene. And you know where she ended up. She's not going to be reporting on UFOs for the New York Times anytime soon because she is getting a movie made of her life story by HBO Max. Right. And she's joined Robert Bigelow at the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies to study ghosts and the paranormal and the afterlife. Yes, things are coming full circle. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Just, uh, you know, it, it does revolve around a very small number of people and very much around, around Robert Bigelow. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people don't even realize this. And a lot of people who have been following the story haven't even heard of Bigelow. And well, they the don't because for had. the most, well, yeah, for the most part, the media have kept him out. Yeah. I mean, when the New York Times, when Blumenthal and Keane uh, did that story, the initial story, you know, they gave Bigelow a very, very narrow part of that story. Um, and to my mind, you know, purposely limited a discussion of his influence and, and of course the strange ideas that he advocated, you know, because like Ralph Blumenthal said, New York Times readers wouldn't have accepted it. And it's been a dangerous concept in journalism, this idea that we should shape stories around what or audiences expect to hear hmm. and not what they need to hear. Now, to their credit, 60 Minutes did do a story with Robert Bigelow once. And then they went back and did that UFO story with uh, Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon and never once mentioned their strange ideas about ultra terrestrials or space spooks. Never once talked about how Robert Bigelow, um, you know, essentially created this program to hunt for ghosts and werewolves and what have you on his Utah ranch. So there is this huge failure in journalism where the right. journalists are trying to make their stories sound serious by purposely cutting out the stuff that they should be reporting, which is, you know, even if you do believe that there is a serious issue to investigate, the people who are doing it are not necessarily the ones you'd want to be doing it because they have certain biases and very strange ideas that are coloring the shape of the uh, results they're reporting. Yeah, well, I, uh, I certainly hope that uh, more journalists do cover that aspect of it. And it's something that I've been increasingly bringing up when, when people talk to me about this, because I think it's a, a very important part of understanding uh, what's been going on in the past and what's going on now with the report and understanding what's going to happen over the next year or two as, uh, as things kind of shake out. So it's going to be quite interesting. What do you, what do you think is going to, going to happen when the report drops? <laughs> what do I think? Yeah. I think that there will be a bunch of stories in the news, and most of them will probably say something along the lines of the report was ambiguous, didn't say very much, and that uh, the usual UFO suspects are very disappointed but are calling for further investigation mm -hmm. and then conveniently uh, link to whatever products and services they're offering to help investigate. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully it will come out in a few days. Uh, well, I, I want to thank you very much for this really interesting conversation. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing story. And maybe we can talk again uh, sometime after the report and see how things actually do shake out in the future. Well, certainly. It's great speaking with you. You too. You have a good day, Jason. Thank you very much. Yeah.